purpose of the tabernacle, as we saw the other day, is listed in Exodus 25. Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. It wasn't as if God needed a house. You can't contain him in a box. You can't contain him in a tent. You cannot contain him in a church, a synagogue. Uh, he cannot be contained. But because they had spent so long in Egypt and been influenced by the language, influenced by the ways, influenced by the gods, and lost their own language and culture and their own ways over 400 years, God had to take them to a place where nothing else exists. No other influences, no other uh, bad patterns, out to the desert. A place where he could teach them the ways. A place where he could show them how to worship. And he was very specific about the tabernacle. It was made according to a certain pattern. And he told Moses, when it's built, build it exactly as I tell you to build it. Don't put any of you in it. It is to be by my blueprint. So it was designed as a specific place for the people of God to meet God. God chose a particular spot and he said, if this area is sanctified, if it is set apart, if it is made holy for me, and you build this tabernacle in the way that I instruct you, I will meet you there. I will meet you there. So it was a place of worship, a place of sacrifice, a place that they could meet God. It was a place that heaven touched earth. Now, this ground that was uh, set apart, it was no different than the ground anywhere else in the desert. But this had been designated and set aside only for holy purposes. And so to make sure that everybody knew where the common ground ended, where the unholy ended, and the holy began, the tent, the tabernacle, was fenced off 75 feet wide, 150 feet long, 75 feet wide in the rear and 75 or, uh, 150, or 150 feet uh, in length on the other side. And it was fenced off not only with these poles that were capped off uh, with bronze and silver, but it was a white linen fence. And remember, white symbolizes purity. And the fence was solid white. And so on the other side of the fence, was all sanctified and holy ground. ground. Was separated into three different compartments or three different spaces. Just inside the gate that we talked about on Wednesday, uh, that whole area there was the outer court. And in the outer court, there were two pieces of furniture or two furnishings. There was the brazen altar that we will look at specifically today, and there was the brazen laver. The brazen altar was seven and a half foot square. So it's seven and a half foot long, seven and a half foot wide, and four and a half foot tall. It would have been elevated up on uh, ground uh, so there would be a space underneath to keep the fire burning continually. Remember we learned that the first fire, God lit. It was holy fire, but after that the people were to keep the fire burning continually. Every morning and every evening that fire was to be stoked. The coals from the brazen altar were taken to the golden altar and those coals were used to ignite the incense that would be offered to God every morning and evening. So we have the outer court where the um, brazen altar and the brazen laver are contained. Copper. And copper, uh, sometimes we hear it uh, translated as brazen or brass. Uh, brass probably did not exist then. Uh, it was copper. And copper symbolized judgment. Judgment. So there was judgment, uh, looking at ourselves, looking at sin, at the altar, and the place of cleansing with the brazen laver. Inside the holy place were three objects. There was the menorah, and remember the menorah burned continually, day and night. In the morning they would trim the wicks and replenish the olive oil, and in the evening they would replenish 
uh, the olive oil and trim the wicks. And guess where they got the wicks from? They didn't waste this white garment. Because when this white garment got soiled, it wasn't washed. It was cut into fine strips, and that's what they used for the wicks of the menorah. Nothing was wasted because God had provided all of it for them. The menorah was the only source of light inside this tent. The only source of light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The other piece of furniture that was in the holy place was the table of showbread. Uh, actually, the Hebrew words would be better translated uh, table of presence or table of face. And this represented, in some ways, the presence of God. This is where the priest would nourish himself with the bread and with the wine. The bread and the wine, a place of nourishment. The third piece of furniture that was in the um, holy place was the golden altar of incense. And the golden altar of incense, like the other two pieces of furniture, was acacia wood with gold hammered over it. This symbolized the place where they would pray. This symbolized their worship. This symbolized the place of petition. And this piece of furniture was closest to the veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. The holy of holies was a perfect cube. It was 15 foot tall, 15 foot wide, and 15 foot deep. And we don't have the time to go into the symbolism about those cubits and why it was a, a perfect uh, cube or square. Um, you can do some reading on your own. You'll be amazed at there is a purpose by all of these things being particular uh, measures. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. The burnt offering was a voluntary act of worship. It was the atonement for unintentional sin in general. So you knew you had done some things, but you didn't mean to do it. It was unintentional, but you knew that you had done some things. And so this was an act of consecration or a surrender of yourself to God. And so a bull would be brung, a ram, or a male bird. God always provided for this nation that regardless, regardless of a person's wealth or status, there was an offering, there was a sacrifice that could be obtained, that they could bring. Because he commanded, don't come to me, don't come before me empty-handed, especially on three particular feasts. So there was a means for everybody. So this burnt offering, the reason why it's called a burnt or a whole offering, is for the most part, it was roasted completely. It was consumed totally. Now this one here is the scapegoat. Uh, we know that because it has the, the red wool tied around the horns, but you would have to bring a male goat. If you were just a common person, you would have to bring a female goat or a lamb. We're going to look at that one last. If you were poor, you could bring a dove or a pigeon. If you were really, really destitute, you could be, bring a tenth of an ephah of fine flour. That is if you were the poorest of the poor. And all of those would help you because it involved your heart, a surrender. It would help you to reconnect and be re reconciled. Now, I want to take a few moments and go back to the sin offering for the common person. I would say that we're all just common people here. So this is the one that applies to us. The common person would bring a lamb to the high priest. And this couldn't be just any old lamb. Uh, you couldn't bring one that you didn't want anymore. It, you couldn't bring one that you knew was sick. You couldn't bring one that uh, you had taken from someone else's flock. This had to be a lamb that you had raised.